You know, throughout the history of warfare, it's no secret that many, many more people die from disease than die from the enemy's weapons. Um, some histories estimate 10, 15 times as many uh, soldiers die from disease as from enemy fire. Uh, by the turn of the 19th tw into the 20th century, that figure, by some calculations, had dropped to about five times as many. When the Boer War happened, for example, in southern Africa between the British and the Dutch settlers there, the British estimated they were losing five times as many soldiers to disease. Well, shortly thereafter, the Great War broke out in 1914, a uh, devastating event. Uh, literally millions and millions of young men uh, poured into the meat grinder of war. Surprisingly, during much of World War I, as we now call it, uh, there wasn't much problem with disease on the Allied side, syphilis. But because syphilis carries the stigma that it does, uh, we don't know much about it, at least at the time. On the uh, side of the Central Powers, the Germans, uh, the Austrians, the Turks, Typhus uh, seemed to be the biggest problem, but nothing particularly significant until January 1918. Just as the war had kind of ground into this awful stalemate, the Americans and Arabs that were on the side of the Allies in 1917, uh, the outbreak of what we call now Spanish flu. It's interesting why we call it Spanish flu. It broke out all over the place on both sides of the trenches. But uh, military censors on both sides tried to keep it a secret. And so nobody seemed to know the extent of the outbreak among the British or the French or the Germans. In neutral Spain, however, where there weren't any censors, there was a lot of news about this terrible flu. And so people began to call it the Spanish flu. Now, nobody today thinks that it originated in Spain. In fact, there's a lot of debate about whether it originated in China or Kansas or France. There are all kinds of theories out there. What we do know is that conservatively between 30 to not so conservatively 200 million people, or 100 million people anyway, worldwide, died from this. A good estimate is that 500 million people between January 1919 in December 1920, when we see the, the final end of this pandemic, we're infected with this flu, this influenza. How much did it have to do with the end of the war? I don't know. Uh, it's tempting to think that everybody got sick and just went home. Of course, we know there were lots of other factors involved in the, the surrender of the Central Powers and the subsequent Treaty of, of uh, Versailles to end this uh, terrible war. What we do know is that uh, these millions of people were suffering and dying as a result of this awful disease. Uh, and war's effect on this awful disease, as people were traveling around, people were uh, uh, contracting it, uh, carrying it all over the place. In fact, uh, even the remotest Pacific islands began to experience uh, the Spanish flu during these two awful years that it raged across the planet. So hardly anyone on the, on the globe spared by this. Now interestingly, there's a little kind of other side of the coin to this. On the German and Russian side, the Russians of course left the war a little bit earlier, but on the German side, uh, there was a terrible potato blight, like the Irish blight that had killed so many back in the 1840s, that began to afflict the potato crop in Germany. Well, the, uh, the, the general uh, antidote for potato blight was uh, treatment by uh, copper sulfate. Well, so much of the copper that was available to make this uh, compound to treat potato blight was bound up in making war material that there wasn't any around to, to treat the potatoes. And so not only were the German soldiers out in the trenches in the filth and the muck uh, suffering with, with the Spanish flu, but they were also hearing that back home everybody was starving to death. And so here we have very much uh, uh, obvious evidence that disease at the very end of the Great War, the World War I episode, certainly played a very significant role as this thing was ending. Now there's an interesting little side note to this, and it is that this particular strain of flu 
uh, is much more uh, potent in young adults. Uh, children, old folks, uh, don't have the immune system developed. And what, uh, again, Dr. Ober can tell us more about this, but what uh, made this flu so terribly is it caused an overreaction of the immune system. So if you were a healthy young person, you were more likely to die from this than if you were a, a child or a, a weaker older person. And so we have these thousands of, of young uh, men uh, living in barracks all over the world, out in the trenches, in camps, uh, contracting this disease and just dying within sometimes hours of the first symptoms. So World War I, the, uh, the pandemic of the so-called Spanish flu coinciding, perhaps influencing one another in profound ways. Very difficult to, to put a really good handle on exactly how much influence ran both ways, but a very powerful story of the effect of disease in history.